I have a topic which says call to influence and I'm saying, oh wow, here are three women who have like already finished everything about influence. <laughs> okay, but here I am. Let's hope we can just kind of put all of this together and take it into our own lives. That's my prayer for this session. Okay, apply it into each one of our lives. Now to start with, definition of influence. Okay, let's just go to the Oxford Dictionary, not the Bible. The capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. To have an effect on the way that someone behaves or thinks, especially by giving them an example to follow. Okay, by the way, timings have changed, so what time I have to finish? One hour. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, influence, so Jesus, right? We all can say the three years of ministry that Jesus did, you know, was a great influence into generations to come, right? I mean, I'm sure we all agree. But let me tell you what happened. Two days back, I went into this uh, a client's place, into this factory, and there was this QC manager and the accounts person. And the minute they saw me walk in, they were scrambling for their masks, you know, to put it on because they know I'm a stickler for rules. Was that influence? Was it not influence? I want you to think. Before, before some of you here are saying, influence, I mean, maybe not me. Maybe not me. And let me tell you, when Nancy asked me to speak, you know what my mind said? Ha, huh, you are gonna speak on influence. What influence are you anyway? Right? And my mind said, you're probably a negative influence. And I said, no. Lord, I'm not going to listen to that. Lord, doesn't matter whether I'm going to influence anyone here or not. I'm going to take this up. And believe me, it was a blessing to me. To me as I prepared. You know, to confess, over the last three, four weeks, or rather two, three months, I must say, I was having sleepless nights. I would wake up 3.30, 4, and I would be worried about some silly, useless thing that happened at work. Believe me, I'm sure some of you can relate to that. Just something, and I'm not able to just get over it, I'm not able to pray, I'm not able to, and I feel miserable because I'm not able to pray. You know, I used to love my time, I used to wake up early morning and I know the Lord used to wake me up to pray. But these were times when I can't even pray, forget for everybody, forget for, and not even for myself. I'm just lying there, just thinking about some silly thing, right? And I believe that this session came at a time when I needed it the most. And I'm praying that it will speak to each one of us as we wrap up. Almost everything that has been said, I think I'm, I'm going to just kind of repeat almost everything that's been said. But I believe the Lord has a purpose. So before each of you or any one of you decide, I'm going to switch off, enjoy my tea, and go into my dream world. <laughs> okay? Don't. Because each of you have a role of influence. Each of you. Don't think you're not significant. Wow, what we heard from Pastor Priya was like, you know, just telling us we matter. We are people of significance. So let's just look at a few people and say, are these people, which one of these are influencers, okay? Anita, teaching Sunday school at church. Rani, teaching her grandchildren to pray. Can you all read? Okay, great. Anju, a housewife moving the heavens in prayer in the spiritual realm. Sheila, extending support to her child who's being bullied. Anne is always diligent with her work in office, standing out among others. Joan, prayerfully supporting her husband. Joyce, as in Joyce Meyer probably, preaching the word to millions of people globally. Well, we think that's influence, but what about the others? Shilpa, who's always fair to her business customers. Becky, who takes a stand against all other students who plan to copy. Judith, like my friend Judith here, a missionary wife who quietly ministers to her husband at home, like Sister Lily here. Tina, a housewife who shares the gospel to all vegetable vendors she buys from. 
Tanya, a young girl who refuses to smoke in the midst of ridicule from her friends. Sandra, who speaks some kind words to an elderly neighbor and brings her goodies occasionally. Elsa, a housewife who carefully manages her money, saves up and gives to the poor. Which one of these? Elsa and Sheila, who is an influencer? All of them? Sure? Fantastic. I'm sure each of us see ourselves somewhere there. Somewhere there. We can relate and say, yes, we are people of influence because God has placed us there with a call, with a purpose. It may not be something that the world sees, but it's something that the Lord sees, okay? We're gonna do a little exercise. You know, I like to draw some things out for me to get it into my head. So I'm gonna request you to take a piece of paper. Hopefully all of you have these things with you. Draw yourself as a me, okay? Me in the center, excuse my drawing, but nevertheless, me in the center, put down the roles that you think you have. Okay, and, and keep this paper with you because I believe that as you go home and reflect, you'll find so many more roles to add. And the more you embrace those roles, you will find that you have a greater sphere of influence where you want to go in and make a difference. Okay, so keep that paper, I'll give you two minutes. Whatever you can remember for now, you know, just, just write down, you know, may be a little specific if you can. You can say like a praying mom or a good wife, whatever, you know, whatever is your role. Keep hold on to that paper, we'll be doing something more with that. Uh, but do remember, like I said, to keep adding to it as we go on. So we're gonna look at three things. Like I said, we are called to influence, to make a difference in the lives of people, difference in things around us, difference in the spiritual realm. God has called us for a purpose. So we look at it in three uh, different parts. I would say embrace your calling, steward your calling, look at the influencer, not the influence, okay? We're gonna look at all these three in three different parts. Embrace your calling. I know we've already heard quite a bit of it, but uh, well, let me do it again. Here's a verse which I just love. It just keeps me going. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. We are his handiwork. We all love handmade stuff, right? Can you imagine each of us made special, separate? I think we heard that earlier on, right? Each of us, we are his handiwork. To do good works, who is good? It is only God who is good. And it is God who is able to bring that influence. And he has created us, he has created us to do that good work, which is on your little paper. All those roles that you have is something that God has created you to do in advance, in advance, okay? Now, you know, I, I hope to take some examples from the Bible and, and, and be vulnerable, share about my own life and the things that I have learned. Uh, so wherever you may be, wherever you may be, you might be the hurting wife in a difficult marriage. That's a role that you have today. That's a role you have it today. Embrace that even. Because God knows where he has placed you. Or a difficult 
uh, you know, difficult child, you have difficult children, maybe a crying mom, but that's a role that you have. Would you, would you embrace it? I think of Mary often as a young virgin in a society where she had to prove her virginity in marriage. And here was someone, here was the, uh, you know, the angel coming and telling her that she's pregnant. And she only thing she said, how can it be? And all she had to hear that it is by the Holy Spirit. And she said, here's your servant, so be it. Can you imagine what did she do? She just embraced her calling. And that's what I want to encourage each one of us. Wherever we are, it may be even the result of a wrong choice. It may be, you know, something that you've done wrong, which you knew, maybe it was disobedience, doesn't matter. Wherever you are here and now, receive that. Embrace that as your calling for now. Just think about it. And there are so many things that we might probably be complaining about. But can we say, I embrace it? Yeah? We're going to look at some hindrances. Why is it that we have difficulty in embracing our calling? Normally, and it's so often that it happens, you feel inadequate. I don't know, or I, have, I don't have that ability. You know, I'm not able to do it. You know, in, in, in the profession that I am in, we face, you know, every day it's a new challenge. There are different, and I love it for that, but it's a new challenge every day. But, you know, it brings a sense of, oh my God, can I do this? Can I do this? I'm afraid, I'm fearful, right? So fear and a sense of inadequacy is something that pulls us away from the calling that God has in our lives. And we look at, you know, so what? How do we overcome this in our lives? But I want you to think and think about it yourself. The times when you've said, oh, but I can't do this. Oh, I'm not made this way, right? Oh, by the way, did anybody write, I'm a money manager? You know, I'm a money person, right? You did? Wow, thanks, Becky. <laughs> okay, so great. You know what? There is no calling that you can fulfill without money. By the way, I can't just help saying that. <laughs> right? There is no. So just don't tell yourself I have no calling to manage money. Because if you want money, if you need money to, to fulfill any of your callings, you would jolly well know because the Lord has and will give you the ability to manage it. Okay? Okay. Then, so fear of failure, all the time, it happens. It's not like, you know, I'm standing here because, you know, I've, got, I've overcome all of these things. No, all the time you're faced with this fear that comes knocking at the door. Will I fail? Why? It can be fear of not doing good things. You know, I, I like to be excellent with everything and I'm afraid that I won't be excellent. And in the process, I pull myself down. I mean, how's that? Yeah? Fear can be such a big thing and it does come to us as believers. It does. And that's why I believe Jesus said, fear not, fear not. I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. He knew, he knows. And that takes us away from the call that he has for us. Misplaced perceptions, I believe, is another reason. Another reason because I don't know what's the right thing to do. And I want to share, in my life, when I got uh, married, of course, I was a chartered accountant already. My husband was an engineer, but he was in full time. Full time, as they used to say, 30 years back uh, in uh, Christian ministry. He was involved in Bible translation work. And then uh, I came to Bangalore and I I knocked at all Christian organizations and I said, here I am, a chartered accountant. Don't pay me anything. I'm willing to serve you. But they were like, oh, lady in finance? No, we can't have you, okay? And then I said, okay. So, but then I knew the Lord was leading me into uh, being a practicing chartered accountant. And about a couple of years uh, into that practice, you know, I kept hearing these voices from people who would say, oh, but your husband is in full-time ministry and you are in the secular work. Oh, something's not correct. Something unholy. Today it happens. But in those days it was, and this voice started growing louder and louder in my head. Right? And I said, oh my, I, I'm doing something wrong. And I said, Lord, all I want is to serve you. All I want is to be in the place where you want me to be. And if I am not there, then I don't want this. But it was a misconception that was, was there in my head. You know, 
I, I'll come to what happened to it later, but I just want to say that misplaced conception, perception of life or life and ministry and what God intends in our life hindered me from being what God wanted me to be at that point of time because I was, you know, what takes up our mind space can just pull us away from where God wants us to be. So just think about the thoughts on your mind and if they are not in line with what the word of God tells us. We heard so much about the word. Beware, okay? Just be careful. Unhealthy comparisons. Wow, I suppose uh, women are like famous for all of this, right? I would have, by now, I, would, I love shoes. I would have watched everybody's shoes and what they've worn and, you know, you know and somewhere I'm saying, oh, you know, I, I find that what we do, we place ourselves on a scale all the time. We're saying, okay, I'm better than this person or I'm not better than this person. I think I'm, that person's better than me and then I'm feeling miserable. Oh, why, don't, why can't I be like that person? You know, you know I'm not as smart as that person. I, I, I don't know something about, you know, something that the other person can do, you know. And that, I believe, again, hinders what God has called us for because each one has a unique and a special calling and we just cannot be what somebody else is meant to be. So if we can, if we can be careful not to compare because in that comparison process, I believe, I believe that we push God out. We push God out because we are trying to be who we think we should be. I'll come to that. Okay, so embrace your calling. Again, wherever you are, whatever situation, whatever job, whatever it is that you're complaining about, just receive them, embrace them, and you will see what God can do with it. Okay, so the second point is um, steward your calling. So it's the same verse that we go back to. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So if we are his handiwork, he is the one who has created us, who has, you know, the whole DNA is from him. Whatever we are able to do is from him. The responsibilities he has given us is from him, right? He is the master, and we are the servant. Do we really believe that? Does our words and our, do our words and our actions really show that Jesus is my Lord? I think that's the question that we need to constantly ask ourselves, right? Do we really act as stewards, as somebody who says, this is not mine. This is what God has done for me. This is what God has done by his handiwork, his creation. That's what I am. Can we accept that? If so, I want you to look at your picture that you have. Okay, I think it's coming up next. Okay, sorry, hold on. Now, God has entrusted the good work to us, okay? Like I already said. And I just love this thing from Joseph. If you think about Joseph in his journey before he reaches Egypt and, you know, becomes this manager in, in, uh, in, the, in Pharaoh's uh, kingdom, uh, you know, he was in the, you know, he was just hated by his brothers. They just hated him, it says. When he told them his dream, they just, he hated him. How many of us being hated by our own relatives, probably? right? Hated. They were put, he was put into the pit. He was, you know, into the well. He was sold as a slave. He was in prison. He was misunderstood, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. So many things happened in his life. You know, it could be like those difficult stages in life that we are going through. But there was one thing that kept him going. And we know that because in the end, when the brothers were so afraid that he is going to do something to them. And you know what Joseph says? You intended to harm me. Actually, he says, am I God before that? Am I like God? Am I like God? What you intended to do to harm me, God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So if, if we would really believe that it is God who is accomplishing his purpose, in and through me. Every situation that I'm going through is going to be something where I say, God, you put me here and you're going to take me through. Even if I've made a mistake, he knows how to make it good and work out well. Right? So would we and are we willing to say, I am just a steward of what God 
has placed upon me, the call that God has placed upon me. So if so, I would like you to look at your diagram and say, put another big circle around it and say, God, and say, God, it is God who has given me everything I am, who I am, what I can do is all from God. You know, the declaration that we say, I will become everything that he has promised. I can do everything that he says I can do, right? Why? Because I am in Christ. I am in God. Everything about me is about in and through and from God alone. And if I can put myself there, I love that verse which says, you know, I, 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 there's one thing I desire, like one thing I desire that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and gaze upon his beauty, that I may seek him in his holy temple. And I love to think of this imagery that if this is the house of the Lord, I will dwell inside it with all my pain and all my shame and all the heartaches and everything that I'm going through. I will bring it all into the house of the Lord and I will dwell there looking at the beauty of the Lord. So just imagine that. Okay, so now we look at what is this stewardship? What is it that God does for us? And what is it that we need to do? Okay. He, whom he calls, he equips. I'm not getting into the verses. You can make a note of it if you'd like. Whom he calls, he equips. Right? You know, you'll be surprised, or probably not, uh, that... Even, I said I got married 30 years back, even a couple of years, maybe a year before I got married as well, I, or even into my marriage, I was terrified to speak. If I'm sitting in a group like this, I wouldn't open my mouth. I used to go for these EU meetings, and if they say sharing time, and I say, gosh, I have to open my mouth. I wouldn't dare open my mouth. But, but God did put a desire in me to teach, and he started equipping me. He started equipping me and, and gave me situations where he would slowly and gently push me and give me words to speak and, and, and taught me how to teach, to watch people. You know, I had mentors come into my life, the people who God brought and he equipped, he equipped me. So he puts the call in our hearts and he equips. And also I must say, you know, I was then, then starting to teach at different places on money matters, then into personal finance with regard to money, what's the biblical approach to money and all of that. And then, you know, very early in my career, there was one prayer that I had in my heart. I was nowhere at that point of time in terms of my career, but I had one prayer. I said, God, use me to bring financial integrity in Christian organizations and in the lives of believers. Yeah, that was my prayer. And I said, I don't know how it's going to happen. And for me, last year was like, I said, God, are you really doing it? Because I was inducted into a board of an organization, which I didn't even know could exist. It, was an, it is an organization which actually brings in financial good practices in churches and Christian organizations globally. Globally and well accredited, excellent processes in place. So here I was sitting on the board, being an influence to in areas of Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, and I'm saying, God, how is it that you put that desire? It's not that, oh, I want to do this, so I'm going to do this. No, it's a desire that God has put in our heart, and he equips. So this particular verse in Exodus 35, 31 is about those people whom God equipped to build the tabernacle. Okay, he just said, God just called them and he said, he gave them skill, ability, and knowledge to just build this beautiful tabernacle. So if God has put something in your heart, which you're already working at, remember you have the skill. Or if it's something that you are yet to get started, don't say, I don't have the skill because God's put that desire in your heart. He will bring that to happen. And then of course he says, fear not for he is with us. All the time, the fear comes. We need to take up and say, fear not, remembering that he is the owner and I am just someone who uh, you know, follows his path. And he directs our footsteps. So I was telling you about this time when uh, 
you know, when, when I, I thought uh, uh, there's something unholy with my secular work and I just have to uh, do something about it. So what I did was I just shut myself in a room for three days and I said, God, you just have to speak to me. At the end of this, either I'm quitting my job and you know, joining some, I don't even know where to join because nobody wanted me, right? Uh, or, I'm, or I'll continue. I just want an answer from you. Is this from the Lord? Because I knew at that point God was saying, stay there, but all these thoughts in my head. And at the end of three uh, days, I believe, I had not heard of marketplace ministries and all on those days, okay? It's now we hear of these terminologies. And, and I believe the Lord was telling me that all these, because I was saying, God, I'm giving tax and consulting, I'm doing audits. I mean, what is this? How does it matter in eternity, you know? But God was telling me that all these systems in the world are things that I have put in place so that this world should run the way I want it to run. And, and I want you to be there. And I said, okay, praise God, that's where I'm going to be. And that's where I've continued to be. I started my work there and I went on to become a partner and an owner of that firm. Okay, so when he grants us, he grants us favor and that surrounds us like a shield. So often we go into these uh, government offices and before I enter, I say, God, your favor has to surround me like a shield. Your favor has to surround me. And that's the only way it can happen. The supernatural, like Saraswati said, has to happen because that's how we are that influence. Okay, he's the one who leads us in triumphant victory, in triumphant procession. He's the one. Okay, and I love this one. He, he, his yoke is easy. We are so weary and heavy laden. If only we would lay down our yoke and take his yoke upon us. It's easy, it's light. Right, that's what he says. Isn't that what we want? We want like a peaceful time when we are just rested, like Pastor Priya said, right? Just rested in him, right? And that's what we, we want to be in. But that will happen when we take his yoke upon us. We have the mind of Christ. Do we really believe that? That I am actually walking Jesus's. I'm Jesus walking around the streets of Bangalore. Can I believe that? And that when Jesus said, I, since I'm going to the Father, greater things than these will you do. Greater things than? What he did will we do because he is going to the Father. So there is no way we can say, I don't know. Because if you don't know, he will equip. He will equip. Or there's no question of saying, I would love to do this, but, but, but. No buts. Because if God has called you for that, he will definitely equip you and strengthen us. Right? And imagine if each one of the be our believers would actually take on Take on and embrace our calling. I'm going to show you a funny picture. You know, you know, at COVID time, when we would see all these pictures of containment zones, right? Remember that? Doesn't matter which place it is. Remember that? We're always looking at where is it more red. You know what it used to remind me of? It's like Christ, 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 Christ. Can you imagine if each one of us, every red dot is a Christ, is a Christ, all over the world. Nobody knows how that virus was going, but if it is Christ, everywhere. Just imagine where the world would have been. And probably that's where it's meant to be. That's where it's meant to be. And in the hindrances, in the things that take away our calling, we can't belittle or we can't forget that the enemy brings in these thoughts. And it's in our mind, I believe, where we have the biggest battle. The biggest battle, because all these thoughts that come are in the mind, right? And we heard how we counter that with our word, with our word. And the word is what God says, who, who God says we are. And I believe that if we have that attitude of being a steward, we are going to fulfill our call. Okay? So, did you put that picture of God around you? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, fantastic, okay. Right. So if we are stewards, God's the owner, then what's my part? Right, we do have a part to play. And I, I loved what we heard earlier on again about, you know, the soul, the spirit, and, and the body. And we have a part to play in every bit of what we do. We have to maintain good spiritual and work disciplines. We heard about excellence. We heard about excellence. We, we need to, we can't at work, we can't be sloppy and lazy. 
We have to be equipped to be the best, to be different, to stand out, to be salt and light doesn't necessarily mean I'm just preaching, not at all in fact. It's my very presence that's going to make the difference. The very presence, right? If we are the fragrance of Christ, we just carry that fragrance wherever we go, right? That's what we ought to be. And for that, we need to have those good disciplines. We need to be in the word. We need to read God's word. We, we need to have times of prayer. Have friends with whom you can pray, especially women. I believe, by the way, sorry for the little few men in the room. I believe that the women have the ability to multitask. Yeah? And we try to make all our men like that. Right? We have a Proverbs 31 woman. Oh my, what a woman she was. Or she is. Right? I mean, she did everything you could think of under the sun. Right? But there are disciplines. She woke up early. She did not, la she did not eat the fruit of laziness. Right? Of course, everything came from the fact that she feared the Lord. That was the basis. Right? That was the basis. And we can multitask. But remember... Let's take all of that to the Lord and make that happen. Commit to follow biblical principles. I do believe that if we do not follow biblical principles in any area of your calling, including finances, by the way, if we do not follow those principles, we will see that we do not have the blessings of the Lord. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy if, you, if you're like messing up with, with whatever, let's say your finances, and then you're saying, God bless me, set me free from this, set me free from this. It doesn't happen like that, right? Because God wants you to go through the disciplining. He wants you to go through a process like we, like we just had heard. So we need to be committed to following biblical principles if we want to fulfill our calling to redeem every opportunity. Make the best use of every opportunity. You know, yes, every opportunity to share the gospel, every opportunity to say, you know, why you are what doing what you're doing and make and prayerfully pray. You know, I remember ask, ask, asking uh, Pastor Ashish, how do you do so many things at the same time? You write a book, you're preaching, you're, all your messages are all written down. I mean, how does all this happen and how do you work and how does all this happen? And he just said, I redeem my time. You know, how did he do that? He just believes that my time is redeemed in Christ Jesus and he just speaks it out. It sounds so simple. I mean, sometimes I think some of these things sound too simple for us to do it, right? Yeah? Redeem, redeem every opportunity. Be faithful with the little. Be faithful with the little and he will give you the more. He will give you the more. You know, so often we say, yeah, God has a big plan for my life and I'm waiting for that big plan. What am I doing now? Still waiting. Yeah? But what about the things you have in your hand today? Right? The loaves, the fishes, whatever you have in your hand, the one talent that you have in your hand, what are you doing with that today? And if we would only be faithful with what we have today, I believe God's ready to give us the next and the next. So let's remember that we need to be faithful. But we need not be fearful again. We need not be worried because remember, it's the Lord who's going to help us do it, right? It's the Lord who's going to help us to do it. And we need to be trustworthy. I already said it in Money Matters. I just can't help saying this because I believe that's very, very important in every area of our calling, whether it's in family life or whether it's in our public ministry, whatever it might be. We need to be trustworthy. And I'll tell you why I'm saying this. If you read Luke 16, 11, Luke 16, 11, it says, if you have not been trustworthy in worldly riches, who will entrust you with true riches? There's some connection there. I don't know what it is between money and God and eternity, actually. There's some connection there. It's something to do with the disciplines we probably maintain, right? So be trustworthy in money matters. Work to be the Proverbs 30 woman. Work to be the Proverbs 30 woman. Actually, I, I, I've rushed, so I think we'll have a time for our prayer and all of that stuff. So I would like, I wanted to do this, but I'm not going to do that. Read Proverbs 31. Read that, you know, the whole about the woman, a woman of noble character. Put your name on it and read it. Yeah, say Manju is, you know, and start off and read it, apply it to your life and seek power from God as 
you know, and to do whatever God has called you. All right. So I'm going on to the third part, which says, look to the influencer, not to the influence. So often we are looking at what the outcome is, because that's the worldly way of doing it, right? We want to evaluate, we want to, you know, we want to do nothing wrong. I, I am in, in, in line with all of that. But as believers, if we are going to look at the influence, the outcome, and forget that it is God from whom we get our influence, a power to influence, we have a problem. Because it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. How does that happen? How are you a witness? How are you an influencer? Because you receive power from the Holy Spirit. You receive power from the Holy Spirit. And let's not forget that. Because I believe we do have talent. We do have ability that we can run with on our own. We can run with, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. And we judge influence in human wisdom, being in human wisdom. Think of the person who's, who's in public ministry, you know, who's, who's, who's going to different places, preaching, teaching, etc., versus the, the, the quiet housewife who's just storming the heavens in her closet. Who do we consider, I'm saying we, not God, God knows where th things are in place, who do we consider as being more influential, right? We sit, we place them at some levels. As long as we are faithful to the call that God has placed upon our lives, I don't think we need to do that at all. And influence and the judgment of that influence is up to the Lord. Yeah? So let's not look at that influence. Often I believe I am the hindrance to fulfilling that call. When I say I, now I want to say it the other way. No, we, remember we said that we are fearful, we are, uh, you know, we feel that I'm un inadequate and hence I'm not able to fulfill my call. It also happens that I am looking at myself and saying, oh, I did this. Oh, I gave this message today. Oh, I shared the gospel with two people and I am feeling so great and good about it. Forgetting that my eyes need to be on God and God alone. Yeah? So, I, you know, you know, when I started uh, doing this uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, in, uh, initial years, I found that after I came back, my mind was full of all the feedback I got. I don't know if I call it pride, because I, I, I don't want to call it pride, but whatever it was, it was bothering me. It was bothering me that I, my mind is full of, you know, this person said this and this person, not good, good things, good things. Oh, that person's reaction was fantastic. You know, I was watching their face, they felt it was great. I mean, it was just eating my mind. I said, no, I don't want to teach and stuff like that if this is what it's going to do to my mind, right? So what was happening? I was getting carried away by the influence. It didn't matter at all. It didn't matter at all. If I am just a channel of his blessing to many people as we declare, right? It doesn't matter. I am just a channel. It's either me or someone else. I just want to do my job well, right? And God just wants me, not what I do. God wants each one of us. He's not saying, bring me this job, this job, this job, and this job, then I receive you. No, he wants us to come to him just as we are. Is that okay? Just as we are. So would we yield and depend on the Holy Spirit? Depend fully on the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? It just sounds like, yeah, of course I depend on the Holy Spirit. You know, I think a, a, a way of doing it is to keep speaking to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me with this. Because Jesus said, when I go, I will send you a helper. A helper to do what? Helper who will give me the power to fulfill the call on my life. On everything that I need to do on this earth while I am here. I have the Holy Spirit. So why wouldn't I take his help? Why won't I take his help, you know? So say, Holy Spirit, what shall I do? Holy Spirit, I'm going to do this. I'm going to meet this person. What shall I do? Keep talking to the Holy Spirit is one practical way of keeping and yielding to him. Because I believe when you do that, you're also acknowledging that I need help. It's not like, you know, okay, I, I, I know it. You know what? Because, must, you know, once we've learned certain things, it's, you sometimes come to a point where you say, okay, I don't really need to pray. Because I know it. 
right? I, and I believe that's a reason why we feel that, you know, Christian leaders fall because their giftings have become so much, they're so used to their gifts. They're so used to the talent and the skills that God has given them that they don't need to depend on God anymore because it's a skill that God has equipped them with, but you know, they have learned to run with it themselves. And I tell you, I find that as the biggest challenge because you know, I'm like a do, do, do person. So I like, I would just sometimes just run without saying, hey, God, what shall I do? Like we heard about, did you say about David? Yeah, how he would ask, went to the same battle, but he would ask, he would inquire of the Lord. Right, And we have the Holy Spirit to inquire from. So inquire of the Holy Spirit. And as we focus on Christ, the influence will follow. As we focus on Christ in our lives, the influence will follow. It may be an influence to your children, maybe your colleagues, maybe just somebody on the road. Just somebody on the road. You know, we, we, we got a dog at home in the, over the COVID period and uh, uh, when my son would take my dog, it was a pretty, pretty disciplined dog, take him out for a walk in our layout, he started taking a, what do you call it, a poop collector or something, right? So there were people, other people in the layout who didn't do that, who were getting very bothered. They say, no, but why are you carrying that? Why are you, because they were just bringing their dogs and the dogs were pooping all over the place. Is that influence? You know, just by his action. And what was it doing? It was bothering them. They were getting angry with him. Why are you carrying that thing around? <laughs> you know, they were getting angry with him. Right? So being an influence, just being who God wants us to be. Just do what God wants us to do. Listen to him, focus on him, and influence will follow. Right? So now in your picture, how shall we put an influence any thoughts? Just to wake us all up. I know we've had a long day with a lot of sessions. How do we put an influence? I have something in my head. Probably you have something. Sorry? As a mother. You know, you have yourself with all your various roles. And you have yourself inside of God. Now I have to influence the people outside. Right? Huh? Replace? Me with God. I'm already inside God. Okay, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to extend my arrow outside. Would you? Extend your arrow outside. So my eyes are on Christ and Christ alone. And he causes my influence to flow out into the spheres of influence that he has placed me in. That's so awesome and so beautiful. It's not that we're striving and struggling to, you know, impact this person and that person and all of that. I'm just doing and being who God wants me to be. Yeah? And I can be the influence, make the difference. I can serve in society. I can serve my husband. I can serve the church. I can serve in the marketplace because he is the one who makes that happen. 